you're not going to be able to get an AI to predict based on new events. I mean, you could, yeah, uh, but are you going to have enough confidence in that to change your, your hundreds of millions of dollars of investment decisions? I don't think so anytime soon. Tom, welcome to Cannes. First of all, what are you doing these days? Tell us what your role is. Thank you very much, John. I really appreciate the question. The, uh, that was the one question I asked you not to ask me. Uh, I'm doing a variety of different things. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I basically there's a couple of streaming services I'm working with to help them understand what they can do with more data. Uh, working still with a bunch of different market research companies, uh, and there's uh, a startup that you know I invested in a couple of years ago, which I'm also working with as well. So. Almost all of your work at the moment has an AI flavour to it, right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Why are you so excited about the power of AI? I mean, everybody is, but what's your particular take on how AI is going to change the media and advertising space? Absolutely. So, I mean, I've been working with these large language models for about three years. Uh, and the thing that fascinates me is, you know, I worked out quite quickly that you can you know, reduce costs significantly. Uh, by deploying them. But the fascinating thing for me is not about how you can just reduce cost for the sake of it, but what happens when you do that. And what you do is you, you're going to democratise access to a whole bunch of different services that you can't, you know, previously hasn't been possible. You know, so one of my favourite examples is, for example, you know, all birds, shoes I love. Uh, all birds cannot spend the same amount of money as Nike on consumer research. Yeah. Uh, but actually, they probably need exactly the same level of consumer insights. And what AI does is it starts to give access to these challenger brands and these smaller organizations to the same level of resources that big brands had previously. It's such an interesting observation. I mean, it covers the creation of creative. It covers exactly. research. It covers a whole set of different things. Self-service platforms, which open up the market to SMBs. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, it, Google made everyone an advertiser. We should probably talk about advertising because we're here in CAN. Yeah? Uh, and I think in the same way that, you know, Google made everyone an advertiser, AI is going to, you know, democratise access to, you know, not just advertising, but yes, content creation we know about, but, you know, consumer insights, data analytics. We're going to th see these things at a scale so that, actually, micro-businesses can start to punch at a, at a much higher level. You know, I think that's a great opportunity for challengers. Yeah? Uh, I think it's more of a risk for the incumbents. Yeah? 100%. Uh, I mean, you, you have to assume if barriers to entry come down, there's a more competitive marketplace, and ultimately the big incumbents have to lose share. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You know, and I think, you know, so market research is something I've worked in for the last three or four years. If you look at, you know, old school, I mean, you understand measurement as well as I do. Uh, uh, you know, old school measurement services, you know, they're enormous organisations with enormous numbers of people and enormous things that are doing, you know. Uh, you know, yes, we, th we often think about, you know, iSpot and video as being the challenger brands. Yeah. What happens when the next level of uh, measurement company comes in that's AI native from the beginning and can provide a significantly better service at a lower cost? You know, this is already what we're seeing in market research. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it's going to come across the board. Do you think there's a, I mean, it depends if your glass is half empty or half full on these things. I, I sometimes hear people talking about a crowding out problem. So if you talk about creative, for example, if everyone is making creative and it's no longer something that only a few brands can afford, there's a deluge of, you know, torrent of AI driven creative. Does the good stuff get lost? Well, I mean, I think if you look at YouTube, for example, you know, when we started with user-generated content, people said exactly the same thing, didn't they? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the reality is, that, you know, is Mr. Beast any good or not? You know, I think, you know, there are millions of people who would argue, yes, he is. Yeah. Uh, is there, is the next Mr. Beast sitting out there and hasn't got someone? I think all, all of the stuff like creative, what matters is not how good the creative is, but how much people actually uh, consume it, you know. Van Gogh, for example, no one didn't buy a single painting in his lifetime. Yeah, uh, he's now considered to be one of the greatest creators of all time. You know. Uh, to tell us a bit about the benefits of AI-powered market research, how does it compare to the old manual human-driven process? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, uh, so the company I invested in, a company called MX8 Labs, uh, Megan Daniels, who I used to work with at Marketcast, she's now uh, she's a CEO of that. Uh, and it's really quite phenomenal, actually. Uh, so market research has historically been a very, you know, labour-intensive business. Yeah, uh, you have people who write surveys in, you know, Word or Google Docs or whatever, that then get sent out to somebody normally in India, yeah, for cost reasons, to program it. They make mistakes. There's back and forth over several days. That gets right. Then it's tested. 
yeah, uh, then it goes into field, yeah, uh, then data comes out of field, you know, maybe a week or so later, uh, people start manually running reports, and then, you know, probably at least 10% of the time, then they figure there's a programming mistake. Yeah, uh, so it's a desperately inefficient process. Yeah, uh, what we found with what Megan found is that actually you go from having something which takes weeks, yeah, to actually days. Yeah, because you know AI can program a survey. Yeah, uh, AI can do testing. AI can do data analytics. All of this stuff is on the fly, and, and it's fascinating that you know, literally, there's a uh, there's a quote uh, from uh, Tim at Wonderkind. Yeah, uh, where he says you know he can actually do ten times more. Yeah. Uh, with MX8 Labs than he could do with uh, you know the previous agency he was working with, and he does say no disrespect to them, but the point is you know AI dramatically changes how much bang for buck you get, yeah, and therefore you know what the smart people are doing is say okay well I can do ten times as much research as I used to be able to do, and that's what I think is going to be disruptive and really you know change the industry. It, it, do you think we're going to see over time people coming to a better understanding of the benefits of human to human interaction versus AI to human interaction in the industry? I'm thinking in the creative space, for example, people are not yet making $10 million Super Bowl ads using AI. It's being still driven predominantly by human creativity. At the bottom end of the market, where SMBs are trying to buy local ads, there's a huge opportunity for low-cost creative. Do you think we might see something similar in the market research space? A kind of a more segmented approach to performing or undertaking different types of research? Well, I, so there's a whole thing in the market research space about can you use synthetic sample, yeah, uh, which is, you know, actually, instead of asking consumers do they like the ad, can you just get an AI to make a prediction? Yeah. Uh, yeah, as someone who's worked with the data for their entire career, I think I, I see lots of problems with that. I think there are applications of it uh, where you don't really care, you want a quick hygiene test. Yeah, uh, but you know the, the those the ads that are really amazing and that are really out there and that push them with creativity, the ones that people remember. Yeah, uh, they would just get rejected by the AI because it's not something it's seen before. Yeah, uh, and I think that where most people are spending money on consumer insights is you know they want to understand how do people feel about tariffs. Yeah, uh, you know how do people feel about you know the fact that the oil price has gone up over the weekend. Yeah, uh, and you know you're not going to be able to get an AI to predict based on new events. I mean you could. Yeah, uh, but are you going to have enough confidence in that to change your, your hundreds of millions of dollars of investment decisions? I don't think so anytime soon. So everyone in Cannes inevitably is talking about AI. It, it's everywhere along the Crescent, wherever you go. Where do you think we are in the AI revolution? Are we right at the beginning of seeing AI's power to transform the advertising space? Or somewhere in the middle, or where on the Gartner hype cycle do you absolutely, think we are? Absolutely, absolutely. So, interesting. so the core technology with the, the core technology that's been disrupting everyone is these large language models, which came from the transformer models, which were first invented in 2017. So we are about five years into that journey. If we look at what the core large language models can do, they're pretty. They're, they've actually been pretty stable for the last couple of years. Right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, they. Uh, we, you know, we've now, we can now easily have a million token context window. Yeah? Uh, you know, the costs, yeah, sure, the costs are being subsidized, but I think the Chinese proved with deep sea that if you put any effort into optimization, you can bring the costs down. Uh, so that's all good. You know, what people are doing with deep research and reasoning, all they're doing is they're chaining together prompts, yeah? uh, and it works very well. You know, I think there's some minor stuff. So my point is the technology is ready. The question is, how do you apply it? And what do you get it to do? Yeah, uh, and the problem is it's really hard to t plumb these things into your old school systems. You right. know, uh, I think you know if you're going to say, okay, how am I going to rewrite Salesforce? Yeah, uh, with AI, uh, that's a much easier question for a startup than it is for Salesforce. Because right. Salesforce has got billions of dollars of legacy business running on it, they can't rip their guts out and rewrite it. Yeah, uh, so I think you know we're just at the. We're, we're, we're the I think the technology is ready. But in terms of adoption, yeah, uh, we're just at the beginning. It's a great point, Tom. Thank you so much for sharing some insights with us. Super interesting. See you next year. Same thank, time, thank you, same John. place. Great pleasure. Cheers, sir.